sanctuary and surveillance. This week on the Laura Flanders Show, can any city really be safe? We talk with Hamid Khan, campaign coordinator of Stop LAPD Spying, about the data mining programs that are proliferating under the Trump administration, and hear from Genesette Gutierrez about what the trans-queer migrants movement can teach people about how to protect those most vulnerable. All that and a few words from me on the hunger strikers no one's talking about. It's all coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the ones who are doing it. Janicet Hamid, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Let's you. start with you, Janicet. We don't hear much about what is happening in the trans community. Sometimes we hear the numbers. Right. Statistics, like one I heard recently, that the average life expectancy for an African-American trans woman was 35 years old. Is that possible? Correct. Yeah, that's very sad and unfortunate that we have to deal with those horrible statistics, right? The life expectancy of a black trans woman, 35. How can we allow that to be, right? As a society, as a community, as a movement. Um, the violence that the transgender woman of color specifically face, it's alarming. Uh, in the U.S. alone, last year, we lost 26 six, uh, trans women. Most of the victims were black trans women. And trans the, men? Um, I believe there's been one or two that have been reported that we know about, but the majority continue to be a black trans woman. This year, Laura, we have already, it's only March, and we have eight trans murders, and uh, seven of those victims were black trans women. Is it possible that the trans men are just not getting reported? Um, I'm not really sure uh, why that is the case, but I'm like, uh, it's 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 alarming to me that perhaps you know they're uh, not being reported as much as the trans woman uh, of color, but it is this uh, horrible uh, situation that I think that transphobia, right? The fact that trans women challenge the binary, the norms, and and um, this dynamic of uh, what what it means to be, you know, mm. we challenge the manhood, the womanhood. So that thing that plays also a, a role in why we, you know, trans women of color especially get murdered at a higher rate. And what does Familia <clears throat> TQLM do? Familia Trans Queer Liberation Movement, we are a local and national based organization. Uh, we are building still, uh, we're only three years old, uh, specifically working with the Latinx community. community. Um, we are uh, working in issues of immigrants' rights, LGBTQ rights, and racial justice, because we understand that here there are issues impacting uh, trans, the trans community, including undocumented trans women, but also there are connections with mm. other communities that we need to build solidarity. So you're, you represent one of those other communities, um, Hamid. Last time we spoke to you, you were talking about the work of your organization, Stop LABT, LAPD spying. Um, it's been about a year. Mm -hmm. How have things changed or not changed since the last time we were in Los Angeles? Hamid? Well, I mean, um, while the playbook remains the same, uh, I think the, the enforcement and the operation, operationalization of that playbook is definitely changing. Um, particularly, I think, post uh, Trump's election, how all these practices are getting much more, much more enhanced, much more severe. And I think speaking about, particularly in the immigrant community, while there's a lot of focus on ICE, the Immigration Customs and Enforcement, what's really missing is the much bigger ICE, the information sharing environment, uh, which has been established uh, for, since for over a decade now, post 9-11, and how data collection has really become the, the, the major tool for enforcement, for investigation, for tracing and tracking and monitoring people. Now, you use the phrase information sharing environment. Mm -hmm. Other people talk about surveillance. Is it the same thing? 
Well, it's, 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 it's bringing together surveillance and data collection from various parts. I mean, this came on the heels of 9-11 Commission report. Uh, Congress passed a law, immigration, uh, the, the Intelligence Reform Terrorism Prevention Act, and in that, in 2004, they mandated uh, the, the executive branch to create a massive environment where for various agencies and private contractors and corporations, both local, regional, international, national, would be sharing information about people where it would be uploaded into various databases and then the outflow of information would happen. And how is that intersecting with the immigration agenda of mm -hmm. the Trump administration especially? Not that there wasn't a problem beforehand. Well, let's look at uh, some of the people that are working with Trump. Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel owns Palantir. Palantir is a data mining firm uh, which is overvalued over $25 billion. And Palantir got a contract with the Immigration Customs Enforcement for about $45 million. But when you look at Palantir itself, first of all, the history of Palantir was that it was developed by a CIA venture capital arm in QTEL. And Palantir has become the primary uh, data analytic uh, you know, just just a, a engine, if you will, to gather information and develop that into predictive algorithms. So Palantir is being used by ICE. Palantir is being used by LAPD in their suspicious activity reporting program. Palantir is being used in predictive policing. So Palantir is kind of mm. becomes this common thread where information is being shared, information is being collected. So in essence, when they talk about sanctuaries, when they talk about that cities are speaking out and political leadership is taking is speaking out against the partnership between police and inf and immigration i think what's really missing is that there's a lot of misinformation and misleading information because immigration doesn't have to wait for a police phone call they're not waiting for LAPD or the LA Sheriff's Department to pick up the phone and say hey we have somebody here they can go into the information sharing environment and identify mm -hmm. anybody and everybody so how is this a trans issue? Why, why are you here sitting next to Hamid here? Uh, obviously, there is a clear connection with law enforcement and immigrant detention centers throughout the nation. Uh, Familia has been involved directly in the campaign to end trans detention here in Santa Ana, California, where for the last two years and a half, through different you know, direct actions, have been um, some of the, the women who are detained, right, get contact with the police for not having a license, for um, some type of minor violations and they get turned over to uh, immigration detention facility. So that's, that's been um, through critical for us to uplift the community, the issues, the struggles that we are facing and how the, for many of us the main first contact is through law enforcement, mm -hmm. right? And now that the new administration has made it clear that they're going to invest more money on law enforcement, increase the militarization of the border, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like that's why it's critical that for us to be able to say with the pressure that we are putting, we're forcing ICE to get out of Santa Ana. Santa Ana was in the news not long ago around this question. How come? Mm -hmm. um, Santa Ana was perhaps the first city to call itself sanctuary, right? But immigration has been holding business in that specific facility for the last 10 years. And um, it's important for us to challenge the notion of sanctuary because, again, we cannot allow a city to call itself sanctuary yet have direct collaborations with ICE. We have a number of um, uh, or LGBTQ undocumented people inside this facility, including undocumented women. Um, immigration wanted to expand the contract. They wanted because the contract expires in 2020, right? So they wanted to renew it for an additional 10 years, let's say. But by having two direct actions. We have forced them to get out. That is the direction that we need to go. If we're really going to uh, embrace fully the term sanctuary, we need to say we need to cut all ties with ICE and, and put pressure to go further, right, and shut it down completely. Yeah. Today at 8 a.m., trans and queer immigrant activists form a triangular human chain, leaned to a metal cage, blocking the intersection at the entrance of the Santana Police Department. 
to call on the city of Santana to terminate its contract with ICE, which imprisons trans and queer people, detained in inhumane conditions. So we came here to shut down the county jail here, which has LGBTQ immigrants detained. We had um, five people getting arrested today in a cage and wrapped up in a cage in the middle of the intersection. Um, the police came after about an hour and a half but we were able to make noise and show President Obama that it's time to stop deportations. It was a very powerful statement elevating LGBTQ voices and making sure our community was heard. This LGBTQ civil disobedience was led by trans and queer immigrant activists as part of the Not One More deportation campaign. Those risking arrest are directly impacted by deportation. And we're asking the police to stop the criminalization of all trans and queer communities. Our communities have faced disproportionate amount of violence both in the streets and by the police and in the detention centers. And we're asking not one more and stop the violence and stop the criminalization of queer and trans bodies. Do you see a model in, in the struggle around the Santa Ana facility that could be expanded? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think there's, there's so many different ways. I think the, and it's a, it's a work in progress because it's not only about ICE and Immigration and Customs Enforcement because the way our data is moving, that it is even through social services, it's even through if you're going uh, looking for a home to rent, um, you may be out somewhere traveling. So I think it's, it's a vast, vast apparatus, the information sharing environment, as I mentioned that earlier. But I think this is definitely a first step towards really dismantling this, this whole apparatus. So that whole dis discussion around the, whatever they called it, safe communities law, the, the, the collaboration between immigration officials and policing, what I'm hearing, it affects trans people disproportionately because you have more run-ins with the police. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the attack that the transgender community is getting, it's alarming. Yeah. While we're a small population yet, yeah, our numbers are highly represented in the criminal justice system in the immigrant detention center and, and exposing us to further violence that we are facing. So it, that should be completely unacceptable. And the, the immigrant rights movement, the LGBT community needs to really center and uplift the leadership of trans women of color specifically. Are you a documented immigrant? I'm undocumented at the moment. And what would be your path to quote unquote legalization? Uh, it's a very complex, lengthy, pricey process. Uh, in my case, my sister has petitioned that they have because it's a citizen, a, a sister of, you know, naturalized U.S. citizen, yeah. so it's a very long wait that is very lengthy. And if in the process you missed any minor information, uh, your application can be pushed back. And is it different for trans people? Um, it, it's more complex for trans people because no government um, at the moment, at the federal level, recognizes our trans identity that I'm aware of, right? So we have to provide our birth-given information that we really don't connect or identify with that makes it more difficult for us to um, pro get through the process without being humiliated, harassed, or dehumanized in, in doing so. So, so if is... the process wasn't difficult enough for most people, it's mm -hmm. even more difficult for you. I will say so that is the case, and that's why to me it's, it's extremely important to let people know that we are being impacted at a higher rate more than the regular population. And in order for us to truly uh, be free in, in this society, again, we have to center uh, trans woman leadership. And how is that changing the work that you're doing, Hamid, this, this new coalition, kind of, mm -hmm, this, this mm -hmm. new expansion of, of, your, of the communities you're working with? I mean, um, and just following uh, Janice's points, I think the, we have to look at the level of vulnerabilities yeah. because it gets very layered. 
And when you triangulate the, the tactics and the programs that they have, because now increasingly what we are also seeing is this expansion in real-time facial recognition technology, mm -hmm. real-time biometrics technology as well, with the use of body cameras. So body cameras, are, while people have been speaking about them as like, well, they will result in more uh, officer misconduct, well, more than that, it's going to expand the surveillance state because body cameras are going to be picking up the information. It's almost a 24-7 mm. surveillance tool. So even if the camera, we had a conversation not so long ago with um, Eric Adams, the borough president of Brooklyn, and he was talking about cameras as possibly a way to document positive interactions with the community. You're saying even in those positive interactions, data is being captured. Absolutely, and every all the background footage becomes evidence. Then when you look at that how these see something, say something programs have worked out. Now we have evidence based on LAPD's own Inspector General audit that over 80% of these suspicious activity reports have come through this see something, say something, so which comes from private individuals. So they're basically providing a license to profile people. Mm -hmm. So when you look at transphobia, and how deep transphobia runs, mm -hmm. who is a suspect person, what is a suspect body, why would they be called in? Then when you bring in predictive algorithms and you start looking at that, how those algorithms would be used against trans sex workers, for example, mm -hmm. so, and who's a suspect in there. So I think it is, it, it's not only necessary, we are obligated because these are the level of vulnerabilities that we need to expose. So what kind of activities are you up to? What, what are you all doing together? Uh, we're really uh, mobilizing, building coalition with other communities, especially the ones that the new administration has openly and heavily attacked, right? The black community, the Muslim community, the LGBT community, but also in the LGBT community, we need to let them know, hey, there are undocumented LGBTQ people that are also being impacted. So that is the word that we have to move forward. That has to be one of the strategic ways for us to move forward and how do we engage in difficult, uncomfortable conversations because many people are not ready to face it, right? Or to know that, oh, um, for instance, there's been moments when I'm told like, oh, I'm undocumented, but I'm not part of the LGBT community. I don't see the connection, so you shouldn't even be part of the you know the conversation much much less decision making so we have to really go hard after our own communities and say hey we can no longer be silenced we can no longer be thrown under the bus like you need to trust the leadership of tr uh, trans women of color and you? one thing if i could add is that i think the other piece that we are doing is uh, that really challenging the movement itself. Mm -hmm. Because I think what is, what is happening is that, that um, as people of color, we who are not black, I mean, all of a sudden, there's this, this mobilization that happens as if the assault became started yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, I'm originally from Pakistan, but I also challenge the, the movements in South Asian communities as well because of the failure to draw parallels and to be there when the black body is being assaulted on the street. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at the assault on the black body, so I think one of our goals is really to constantly challenge mm -hmm. that we need to ground ourselves in, in black liberation and really just to challenge our own anti-blackness. And if you want to talk about vulnerable bodies, let's talk about women too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What about sanctuary then as an answer? It's probably the single most often occurring word mm -hmm. in the conversation around resistance to the Trump administration's mass deportation push. Well, we have sanctuary cities. There's a sanctuary movement we need to defend. Sanctuary cities are going to be penalized by the federal government. There's a contention over that now. Right. Are we going down a, a helpful track here with this talk of sanctuary? Um, I do welcome the idea of sanctuary cities and municipalities and colleges and universities and spaces for protection, right? Uh, but I do believe that it is um, important to redefine what does sanctuary mean, what does sanctuary look like. We cannot just heavily concentrate in one community while other communities are being heavily attacked, for instance, like you know, the black community, the Muslim community, the transgender community. So we need to really be more um, broader in our definition. So when we talk about protection, we mean all people, including those um, immigrants with criminal records. And, and I think just um, on, on the flip side to that, I think this, this whole conversation can become a slippery slope as well. Because sanctuary, as we are reminded by, by particularly elders in the black community, is also a containment zone. 
where you are you are sort of confined within a certain zone and if you step out of that zone you or your body is in danger so i think many a times and while a lot of uh, political haymaking is taking place on on both sides what is happening is that there is not really solid information being shared about how vulnerability is so layered, how information gets shared, how it's not just a matter of seeking sanctuary in a place of worship or in your house, that unless we really are able to move freely around, so I think we have to really just frame this in the bigger mm -hmm. conversation of liberation. We've been working with the people from Equality Labs, Denmori Sandra Rajan and others, around digital security. Um, trying to make some simple sort of harm reduction strategies accessible to more people. It's hard for me to imagine a harm reduction strategy around what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But maybe you have one. A and more broadly, how can people listening or watching this um, respond to a challenge that seems so huge, mm -hmm. uh, the way that you're framing it? Because maybe they're attracted to sanctuary cities because at least you can get a handle on that, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. To me, Laura, what I see, like, a, a city cannot call itself sanctuary when you have, uh, again, for instance, Santa Ana has a city jail that has a section for LGBTQ people, right, that is called the LGBT pod, um, and some of the uh, uh, people there are uh, undocumented women. Which prison is this? In Santa Ana, California. Santa Ana. So how can you really call yourself sanctuary when you have this facility here that is collaborating with ICE and holding people in cages uh, and putting them through so many human rights violations, right? So it's, um, we have to really, that's why uh, this victory, what's important for community organizing with amazing support of local uh, organizations in Orange County, uh, especially undocumented youth that were at the front lines of, of because here we have an opportunity to not only shut down the, the immigrant detentions of Part, part of it, but also the entire mm. uh, city jail, right? And I think instead of having that space to put our people through so much harm and pain, how do we use that space to um, be able to uh, allow people to be themselves and thrive and be productive people to society mm. and be respected in a very dignified way? So I think that is the, the way we need to move. And yes, it is extremely difficult and complex because sometimes there will be very uh, hard disagreements with the community, but in the end, the long term is to uh, abolish all detention centers and prisons, right? Some find alternatives. How do we handle um, these type of um, conditions mm. that are happening that to me are inhumane and are not working for communities of color? Last word from you, Hamid. Well, I think uh, ultimately where there's a lot of oppression, there's a long history of resistance as well. And I think that's what we've been doing and lifting, that how do we strengthen this culture of resistance? How do we share knowledge with our communities? How, how do we learn from the elders who have been fighting this system of oppression for so many years? And, um, and I think at the end of the day, it just comes down to that however we look at sanctuary, liberation and freedom, really comes along that as communities are building power together. It's about food, it's about shelter, it's about safe streets, it's about access to health care. It's not only about immigration mm. raids. Mm. We can get more information um, on our website about both of your organizations. Thank you. Perfect. Yes. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Eight people have died in U.S. immigration and customs enforcement detention centers so far this year, compared to 10 in all of 2016, according to a review by the Daily Beast. 15 out of 18 of those deaths took place in privately owned facilities. You know the ones, the ones run for profit. In two days this May, two ICE detainees were found dead in one place, Georgia. One 27-year-old, Juan Jimenez Yosef, hanged himself in his cell following 19 days spent in solitary confinement. While Donald Trump's travel ban is on hold, the immigration story seems to have faded. We, the public, know next to nothing about any of these deaths. ICE is required to investigate every death in detention and produce a detainee death report, but generally they don't release those to the public, and when they do, there's no guarantee of coverage. Which is part of why detainees have regularly launched hunger strikes to try to call attention to their plight. Earlier this summer, behind the razor wire fence ringing California's biggest detention center, about 30 women went on a three-day hunger strike. 
They're asylum seekers. They have no criminal records, they said, and still their bail is set impossibly high for poor people, which is what they are. The hunger strikers issued demands that included reduced bail, political asylum, new uniforms, health care, and 24-hour access to clean water. What they really want, of course, most of them, is to be released and united with their kids and safe. That's why most of them came to the U.S. in the first place, as part of a caravan fleeing violence in Central America. Adelantos, run by the Geo Group, Inc., a Florida-based company that owns, leases, and manages correctional and detention facilities, runs the facility those women hunger struck in. And guess what? It's been doing well in the stock market since the last election, notwithstanding three deaths at the place. In late 2015, 26 asylum seekers in Adelanto, people who were waiting to be released from custody, launched a hunger strike that lasted nearly two weeks. Earlier that year, more than two dozen members of Congress wrote a letter to the U.S. Justice Department and ICE officials expressing concerns about reports of medical neglect. You've got to wonder, protests, Congress, hunger strike, deaths? What's it going to take before Americans notice what's happening? Think detention camps can't happen here? They can. They do. And just what are we going to do about it? You can write to me. Tell me what you think. I'm Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.com. And thanks.